Thank you for coming out to hear Lawrence Schoenberg present his memoir, Four Men Shaking. My name is Jennifer Wirtgen, and I'm the director of the Wellfleet Public Library. And we feel very lucky to have Lawrence back at the library where he has read before. It's always so lovely to have writers back come back to, come back to us and fill our meeting room once again with their beautiful words. Four Men Shaking is a lovely work. I was lucky enough to receive a copy of it in advance of its release date, and I read it outside, and I suggest you do the same. In its starred review, Publishers Weekly called Four Men Shaking an enthralling memoir, and the reviewer stated that Schoenberg's enlightening memoir about three transformative relationships is access accessible deceptively simple and wise. Author Jonathan Lethem stated, Four Men Shaking felt to this reader a deeply necessary utterance, one effortless, effortless <laughs> 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 I'm having trouble tonight, effortlessly delivered after decades of rigorous preparation. By the time I finished, I was a fifth man shaking and with gratitude. <laughs> Lauren Schoenberg is the author of the celebrated Zen memoir, Ambivalent Zen, as well as the nonfiction book, Brain Surgeon, An Intimate View of the World, of His World. He has published three novels, Crust, One on One, and Memories of Amnesia, and his fiction and journalism have appeared in Esquire, Harper's, and the New York Times Magazine, among others. He is the recipient of a Pushcart Prize for a monograph on Samuel Beckett published in the Paris Review. Copies of Four Men Shaking are available for purchase for $17, and I'm honored to say that Lawrence is donating all proceeds from the sale of these books back to the library. <laughs> it's gestures such as this that make me feel so honored to work in this beautiful, generous community. So, kindly silence your cell phones and welcome Lauren Chamber back to the Wealth Food Library. Thank you. It's so great to be here. and It's a great honor to do my first reading of this book in this great building it's meant so much to all of us for so many years and so much in this community. So it's a great honor to be here. Thank you. Larry, could you? All right. Among other things, this book is the story of three amazing strokes of luck. Three relationships which came my way and changed my life because I was in the right place at the right time. As its title indicates, the book is about four men. One is me, and the other three are Samuel Beckett, Norman Mailer, and a Zen master named Kudo Nakagawa Roshi, with whom I studied for many years. I imagine these three as a triangle that surrounds and inhabits me. Over the years, I've come to understand that each reflects a different part of my mind, perhaps the human mind in general, and since these three are total contradictions of each other, the book seems to me a study in the way that each, like all of us, is shaped by the way he confronted them. I met Beckett in 1981 when I sent him a book I had just published titled Brain Surgeon. It was a report of time spent with neurosurgeons on the ward and in the operating room. I had no introduction to him. I sent the book Care of His Publisher as an act of homage to a writer who'd been a deity for me since the time I'd discovered him in my mid-twenties. Of course, I did not expect an answer. What I did not know was that while he read almost nothing of contemporary literature, he was no less obsessed with the human brain than I was. Two weeks later, I opened my mailbox to find his answer in an envelope with no return address. His handwriting was close to illegible, very small, very precise, 
a sort of calligraphy, in fact. But after several moments, I was able to decipher a few lines which were completely, you could say, Beckettian. <laughs> the work of a man who was incapable of small talk and never put his pen to paper without serious attention. As I'd, later, as I'd learned later in correspondence with him, he treated almost everything he wrote as a last chance to articulate the obsession that gripped him at the moment of his writing. Dear Mr. Chamber, he wrote, your book impressed me strongly. I read it too fast and shall read it again. Mere decay is a paltry affair beside the calamities you describe. It's all I can speak of and the ever acuter awareness of it and the preposterous conviction formed long ago that here in the end is the last and by far best chance for a writer gazing into his synaptic chasms. Forgive such poor private response to your book. I am a poor hand at this form of communication. With all good wishes for your future work, yours very cordially, Sam Beckett. Stunned with disbelief, obviously, I wrote to thank him and riding the wave of my excitement, asked if I could one day meet him directly. Again, I did not expect an answer, and again, I was wrong. He wrote to say that he'd be pleased to see me if and when our paths crossed, adding, any chance you'll be in Europe soon. <laughs> he never could come to the States. Just once he did. He would never do it again. As it happened, the British version of Brain Surgeon was scheduled to be published a few months later, and I was set to do publicity in London. Amazingly enough, Beckett wrote that his schedule would take him to London at the same time for rehearsals of a production of Endgame that he would himself direct. Thus it was that a few months later, a day after I arrived in London, sleeping off my jet lag in the early afternoon, the phone rang in my London hotel room. I'm sure you can imagine my wide-eyed response when I heard the voice on the phone. Hello, Mr. Schoenberg, Sam Beckett here. <laughs> Still brings tears to my eyes. <laughs> he was cordial on the phone and even more cordial the following evening when at his invitation, I met him in his hotel. I was seriously nervous, of course, but the first surprise on meeting him was the speed with which greeting me for all the world as if honored by my visit. He put me at my ease. <clears throat> this was London's Hyde Park Hotel, a small, comfortable room with a single bed, an upholstered easy chair, and a dressing table with a small upholstered bench in front of it. No sign of its occupant except a brown corduroy jacket on the bed, a carry-on bag in the corner, and on the dressing table, a notebook, several small medicine bottles, and four books. From across the room, I could see Dante, and just beneath him, eat Endgame, in the same soft-cover edition I had brought with me and reread on the plane coming over. Beckett directed me to the easy chair, poured Irish whiskeys for both of us, took a seat on the corner of the bed, and plied me with questions. How is my flight from New York? How long will I be in London? How's my book doing? He remembered the names of surgeons and patients I'd written about and asked with serious concern how each was doing now. His Irish accent was pronounced and musical. This was as close to small talk as I'd ever get with him. I grew more and more relaxed as we talked, but not so much that I did not feel a sort of disbelief when I asked him, and I'd ask most any old writer friend I saw all the time, how's your work going now? Though I asked it casually, the question was anything but trivial to him. And indeed, it was almost as if he'd never been asked it before. A long pause ensued. He closed his eyes for a moment, and in a gesture I'd soon learn was habitual with him, a sign that he'd sunk into concentration, 
He put his long middle finger over the space between his nose and upper lip. Later on, when we established a correspondence, I'd often imagine him thinking like this, with his hand in this position just before he wrote me. This was not, of course, because our friendship was intimate, but because on subjects that were important to him, he never took it for granted that he have another chance with them. His answer that night, like his first note to me, was inspiringly Beckettian. Like almost all his work, it seemed to address and embrace the ambiguity and contradiction, the essential shaking of the human condition, which 35 years later I tried to address when I sat down to write this book. You know, he said, I always thought old age would be a writer's best chance. Whenever I read the late work of Goethe or W.B. Yeats, I had the impertinence to identify with it. Now, my memory's gone. All the old fluency has disappeared. I don't write a single sentence without saying to myself, it's a lie. So I know I was right. It's the best chance I've ever had. <laughs> Seventy-four years old, he looked frail that night, a lot more gaunt than his photos had led me to expect. For a man who'd once called writing disimproving the silence, in an attempt, quote, to exploit impotence, and had gone through periods of debilitating depression, especially in his, early, in his 30s, he'd been writing fairly steadily since his early 20s, publishing 12 novels, 16 plays, 14 radio plays, a film script, and a remarkable book of criticism on Proust when he was 25. It's a paradox, he continued, but with old age, the more the possibilities diminish, the better chance you have. With diminished concentration, loss of memory, obscured intelligence, what you, I suspect, would call brain damage, the more chance there is for saying something closest to what one really is. Even though everything seems inexpressible, there remains the need to express. A child needs to make a sandcastle, even though it makes no sense to do so. In old age, with only a few grains of sand, one has the greatest possibility. I met Mailer by way of another book, 14 years after I met Beckett, when I gave him the galleys of a memoir called Ambivalent Zen in hopes of getting a blurb. As with Beckett, I knew the odds were long against me. Although I had encountered him two or three times socially in Provincetown, I was sure, pretty sure Norman would not remember me. Even if he did, there was no reason to think the book would interest him. For that matter, Given the pile my, my book would surely join on his desk, it was far from likely that he'd notice it, much less take the time to read it. What I didn't know about him was that he was compulsively generous with blurbs. Books had to be very bad to be ignored. <laughs> and if they were written by a Provincetown writer or one of, one of them who lived like me nearby, they had to be close to unreadable. <laughs> Six days later, he called to invite, invite me to dinner with my wife, Vivian. We joined 10 others at the long table in the dining room at the red brick Bayside house he shared with his wife, Norris. And whenever they came to visit, one or more of his nine children or 10 grandchildren. Present that night were two of his daughters with their husbands, a couple of local friends, and a BBC journalist who'd arrived that afternoon to do a radio interview. Mailer introduced us as if we were regulars at the table. He was so comfortable in the roles of husband, father, and host that it was easy to forget what he was for me. Except for Beckett, no other writer had influenced me as much. But since he and Beckett were utterly different, polar opposites to be exact, no one could represent better than Mailer the dilemma I brought to my work. Like him, though with much less success, of course, I'd been a journalist and a fiction writer. A question I, almost, I often ask myself, why I persisted in the latter when I was so much better at the former 
was a question that many had asked about Mailer. Ambivalent Zen wasn't mentioned during dinner, but as we were finishing dessert, Mailer pointed a finger at me. This guy wrote a pretty good book. It's called Ambivalent Zen. You know why I like it? It shows me why I've always hated Zen so much. <laughs> Amid the laughter that followed, I didn't get a chance to question him. But later, as we said goodnight at the door, I said, what have you got against Zen anyway? I'll tell you when we talk, he said. How about dinner next week? We met, as we'd agreed, on a cold December night at a Provincetown restaurant a few blocks from his house. I'd promised myself to question his dismissive comment about Zen, prepared a careful argument, in fact, but not knowing yet how quick he was to take over conversations, I didn't act fast enough. <laughs> Soon after we took our seats, he extended his arm across the table and abandoning his normal voice and accent, for the guttural faux Southern he favored when trying to drum up excitement for himself. He said, okay, my friend, loser buys dinner. Let's see what you're made of. <laughs> this was Michael Shea's barbecue, his favorite place in town. A plain, sprawling fish and ribs joint. It looked like it didn't belong in Provincetown, but he liked it during these winter months because it was usually empty and quiet and because, as I was about to learn, he was obsessed with the waitress who just brought our drinks, <laughs> slid into the booth, and given him a lingering kiss on the mouth. God, you look good tonight, he said. Are you getting something I don't know about? You know there's no one for me but you, Norman. We're going to have to have our date soon. Any time, Norman. I'm always up for it. He took her hand and looked at me. Because of this woman, I finally understood all women. The less you give them, the more they give you. As I've learned later, he'd pursued her just this far and no further for years. He shook his head as she walked away. Isn't she beautiful? God, I must look like Methuselah to her. In the old days, I'd be pushing like crazy for pay dirt, but now I can't do anything but look. <laughs> He sipped his drink in silence for a moment, then returned to his thumb wrestling challenge. His thumb was vertical, poised like a bud in a vase, his hand cupped on the table. Cupping my own around it, thumb wrestling after all was not unknown to me. I found it surprisingly small, but unsurprisingly stationary, defiant, as if rooted on the table. Eyes fixed on our hands, elbows firm on the table, we touched thumbs three times and began. Circling, feinting, aiming for leverage and the final subjugation and control, which is victory and subject, and thumb wrestling, we were totally engaged at once, completely lost in the game, fixed with life or death intensity. I felt his knuckles in my palm, his fingers gripping mine. My thumb stretched toward his and withdrew, stretched and withdrew again, and his did the same with mine. The table shook, drinks and silverware rattling. Strategy, strategy, of course, was everything. One did not win this game on strength, but on seduction and evasion. Set traps, fake surrender by leaving your thumb as if, it each, as if it's your opponent's mercy, attack, slip away, and so on and so on. After a moment, Norman's aggression went too far. I offered my thumb, and he went for it, and I slipped away and pinned him. <laughs> Surprised that I'd won so easily, I checked his drink to see if he might have had too much too fast. No, it seemed to me, it, no, I seemed to have beat him even up. It may well have been that in the years of our friendship, which, we should, which would continue until his death, 12 years later in 2007, nothing I did impressed him more than this victory. <laughs> As any friend of his would tell you, however, he was not by any stretch a good loser. I thought Buddhists were pacifists, he said. How come you're so aggressive? <laughs> 
The final corner of the triangle I address in the book is my longtime Zen teacher, Kyudo Nakagawa Roshi, whom I met a little more than a year before I met Beckett and studied with for 27 years until his death, just a month after Norman died in 2007. The event I'll read about now occurred in August of 2007 when he flew from Japan to New York to offer what turned out to be his last teachings to the small group of students like me who'd gathered around, who'd gathered around him in New York, London, and Israel, and sometime, as in my case, followed him to Japan. My book actually begins with this chapter. I hope you'll see within it the paradox or what in Zen we call a koan, that led me to my title and my subject. Like Mailer, many people argue with Zen, but no one who knows anything about it, certainly no one who knew the man I met at the airport that day, will underestimate the degree to which it cultivates one's tolerance for contradiction. As I said, the book begins on the first day of his last visit when I met him at the airport. Roshi dozes in the front seat. Watching him from the back, my eyes are fixed on his bald head as if concentration alone will ease me out of my confusion. I'm stunned by the shift in my state of mind. Half an hour ago, waiting for him to come out of customs, I enjoyed the equanimity I always felt when about to meet up with him again. After all, he was my teacher. The connection I was about to resume was not just with one irascible Japanese monk, but with the faith and confidence I found almost every time I sat on my cushion, straightened my back, followed my breath, and believed, yes, again and again, that I was escaping the tyranny of my brain. What has changed since that moment? Why do I feel I'm collapsing somehow? that any thought I'm about to have will only deepen my confusion. And why does this surprise me? This is Zen, isn't it? How many times have I realized that there are regions in my brain that resist my escape from it? That these regions seem to be exactly those I need when I sit at my desk and try to believe in the sentences I write. Confusion, better to call it neurological dysfunction, what else should one expect to happen in the brain of a writer who commits himself to the study of Zen, not to mention a Zen student who continues to believe in language and description? The head drops quickly. Roshi is fast asleep before we leave the airport. He's never been good at air travel, and he's suffered more from it as he's grown older. Now, at 80, the 13-hour trip from Japan is almost debilitating for him. If the past is any guide, he'll be jet-lagged for the next four or five days, disinclined to answer the phone or make anything more than minimal conversation, avoiding especially his English-speaking students. His already fractured attempts at our language have further deteriorated since he moved back to Japan five years ago to become abbot of a monastery called Ryutakaji, where he trained the monastery which many in the Zen world continue, con, consider one of our most important practice centers. Neither jet lag nor, language, nor the language gap will severely restrict him, however. If the past, again, is any guide, this old monk will be on his cushion in our little zendo in the Soho section of downtown New York by 6.15 tonight in order to ring the bell at exactly 6.30 that begins the first of our three 30-minute meditation periods. Tomorrow morning, he'll be up by 6, sit alone for an hour or more, and then ecstatic to resume the sort of chores his monks take care of at the monastery, <laughs> vacuum and mop the zendo and the four flights of stairs between it and the street-level door to our building. This is a payback visit. Six years ago, when invited to become abbot of Ryutakaji, he endured two days of uncharacteristic vacillation, the only hint of ambivalence I'd ever seen in him, before concluding he had no choice. Much as he loved his students 
and our little Zendo, his TV, pro wrestling especially, and his daily walks in Chinatown or the village, his first devotion was to his teacher and his teacher's teachers, and thus to the monastery where he lived for 13 years before agreeing to his teacher's request that he establish a Zendo in Israel, a country he'd never heard of before setting off for it, a few weeks after the Six Day War in 1967. It was there that I met him 12 years later when like many in the Zen world, I made a special trip to meet this brilliant, eccentric teacher I'd heard about, who was maintaining a small zendo in a little cottage on the west bank of Jerusalem. He remained in Israel for 14 years before heading to New York, then maintained our small zendo in Soho for 15 years before circling back to his point of origin in Japan. To ease the pain of our separation, the range of emotion experienced by students for whom a teacher like him becomes an amalgam of every spiritual, paternal, or neurotic ideal our minds produce. He promised to return for a month every August when his monastery closes for vacation. Today, as for the last five years, he's keeping his promise. Along with two other students, an Israeli, Amnon, who followed him to New York from Israel, and a Japanese woman, Kazuko, who found her way to the Zendo when she came to New York to study painting, I've come out to meet him in Amnon's van. Now we crawl in hot summer traffic on the Long Island Expressway while Roshi sleeps in the front, and sitting in the back with Kazuko, I consider as if for the first time the confusion that Zen generates in my mind, my brain, or the mix of the two that one confronts so vividly in sitting meditation. Kazuko is dark-haired and stocky, a humorless woman in her mid-thirties with cold, dark, suspicious eyes and a slightly condescending manner that makes her very difficult for me. Her eyes and face give no hint of her thoughts or mood Though we have no great fondness for each other, we've managed to work together doing the brunt of Zendo chores, valuing above all that we can count on each other to be on our cushions when the bell rings, remaining still through the great range of pain, anxiety, exhilaration, and realization that Zazen produces, thus finding a kind of admiration, respect, and since our membership is small, a mutual gratitude for each other. She knew nothing of Zen in Japan, but within months of discovering the Zendo, she became Roshi's favorite companion. Among his students, she shares his language. I'm alone among his students, she shares his language. After she took an English for foreigners course, she became his frequent, barely competent translator, when as often his English fails him. Like most Japanese I've known, she's guarded about her private life, especially her background in Japan. Though we've known each other for more than nine years and practiced together for countless hours, I know nothing about her current life or her life before that in Japan. Then again, we've never been in the back seat of a van together, stuck in traffic on a hot August day. While Roshi sleeps, she eases into a surprising confessional state of mind, telling me how and why she came to New York, how she began to paint as a teenager, and resolved early on to study in America, and finally, how she found her way to Zen. None of this, as far as I can see, has caught Roshi's attention. But when she turns to her family life, describing a difficult childhood, a family so dysfunctional she was forced to leave home at 15, the bald head rises and barely turning toward us sends a rush of Japanese in her direction. Done with his tirade, the head drops again. <laughs> Kazuko sighs and looks out the window. After a moment, I can't contain my curiosity. <laughs> Is he angry at you? Yes, why? He say I'm losing all my energy to memory. On that note, I'll leave you tonight. 
asking you to consider what it meant for a writer to hear those words, you losing all your energy to memory when he was struggling to write a memoir. <laughs> I guess we have time for questions if you want. Do you feel you're losing memory and it affects your ability to write like your friend Sam? <laughs> it hasn't helped me so much as it helped him, I don't think. <laughs> I'm, I'm always hopeful. Uh, but I. Um, no, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't, don't put myself in that category at all, but I do try to aspire to it, learn from it. I never stop learning from that statement that he made to me, but uh, what he's deriving from his own deficits. You know, he, um, he famously said in a, in, a, in a TV, I mean, in one of his only newspaper in, interviews, that he said, uh, my, my work is about exploiting impotence I don't believe impotence has been exploited in the past. And uh, that, I, uh, that's where he comes from. I mean, it's just amazing in consistency and integrity throughout his life. Could you speak to the conflict that you experience between the writing and the writer? Say that again? Could you speak to the conflict that you said you experience? Well, um, I, uh, I, I, I had many arguments with Norman about then, of course. And that was the beginning of our relationship and sort of the glue of our relationship because he lived for argument. And uh, nobody I ever knew who lived for it so much. But, and he particularly loved the argument about Zen. And uh, in the end, uh, I actually came to understand that he was a lot closer to Zen than he could bear to admit or bear to face. And I don't think I was quite, um, I don't think I was skillful enough in making him see that because I got caught up in the, in the excitement of our argument. You know, he was a really charming, witty character. And uh, I always got caught in the kind of waves that I, as I said here, how fast he took over conversation. But uh, he was a lot closer, a lot more of a Buddhist than he could bear to admit. Uh, How's that? Well, he, because he had a complete, if you look, uh, if you had a complete understanding of what it meant to search for the ineffable, and the ineffable, what can't be described is the essence of Zen practice. So uh, he was very much committed to it, although he couldn't, of course, he wasn't literal about it, and he was... Uh, he, could, that he would never have admitted it. And as I say, I wasn't skillful enough to make him see that. Luckily for me, maybe. But, uh. Could you talk a bit about the effort to create these three different narratives? As you said, um, the first part of the book is about your Zen master, and it's the third of the three that you read. How did you weave them together? Well, I, you know, I was never sure. It was, it was very difficult all for me for years. I was a long time on this book. But uh, I think what wove them all together was just feeling of gratitude. That was when I was, uh, had my great best luck with it because uh, each of them was so important and each so profound in their own way. And as I say, not as far apart as they seem to be. Um, but... Um, you know, I, I just, it, was, it was fairly easy to write the descriptive part because they were all, each of them, so interesting. And uh, I just had to let that happen. But my own response to it was, was where the problem came. You know, you know about that. More questions? Okay. Thank you very much for coming.